Welcome to another Greatest Hits episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but you know what? After spending this week together, I think we're on a first name basis, so you can just call me the Fintern. To round out this special five day edition of the show, I'd like to play a roundtable episode that features a woman who the city of Houston gave a key to the city to for her work in finance, Sharita Humphrey. She's joined by Len Penzo and the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. They're talking about coaching and how it can impact your life. That's all for me. The basement is finally clean and ready for another eight weeks. And man, are these weeks going to be great. Joe's sheet here says we're going to bring you a woman in charge of personal finance and retirement planning at Morningstar, Christine Benz, historian Megan Gorman, who shares all of the lessons we can learn from past presidents and the way that they handled their money, former football star Brandon Copeland on kicking off your financial plan on the right foot, and marketing legend Seth Godin. It's going to be a great fall season here in Mom's Basement. You know, now that I've sprayed some Febreze. Enjoy, Finn Turn Out. From Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and Buenos Dias, Los Bonitos Peros. It's World Tourism Day, and I'm coaching you not only in Spanish, so you can speak the language on that trip to France you got coming up, but we're also helping you find coaches for all the other important aspects of your life. So on today's show, we bring you financial guru Sharita Humphrey, plus another great coach, the retirement answer man himself, Roger Whitney. And from LenPenzo.com, it's Mandy Moore. <laughs> She's busy with her first song in 10 years. It's just Len Penzo. But that's not all. In honor of National Tourism Day, we'll take a break halfway through the show to talk about the best places for digital nomads to work and live abroad with Kat Kalashi, an editor with Live and Invest Overseas. And, of course, we'll also save time for my amusing trivia. And now, a guy who can never roll his R's, it's Joe Saul Sihai. I can't roll my R's, but I can roll into another episode of the Stacky Benjamin Show. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> hey, everybody, I am Joe Saul Sihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And do we have some fun for you today? Because we have coming to us live from his bunker deep under los angeles mr len penzo is with us i believe yeah a little stressed but yes i'm with you what are you stressed about? how are you stressed you're the guy that if there's something that happens like a nuclear holocaust you're protected <laughs> yeah but my papa john's points are expiring in three days and i'm on a diet <laughs> and so now i really don't know what i'm gonna do that is you gotta be sweating this out yeah, I mean, you know, what? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'm trying to starve myself here. It's, it's like I had a bowl of Cheerios today and for breakfast, and I had ten pretzels for lunch. So it's like, you know, I, you know, this, I, I don't know how I'm going to continue on with this. And then, like I said, I got a notice in the mail that my Papa John's uh, points are expiring. So we're going to get uh, with with that type of nutrition line. We're going to get like a third of the way through the show, and listeners are going to hear a, and that's like your head hitting the microphone. It could be. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> and, you're, and you're done. I'm and used to 5,000 calories a day. In, instead of five. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And joining us, our special guest today, she is coming to us all the way from Houston, Texas, the woman behind Faith, Family, and Finance. Sharita Humphrey joins us. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Joe. Well, it's about time we got you here. Oh, I'm excited. Well, tell everybody, the the three people that don't know about Faith, Family, and Finance, what you're all about there, because you're a financial coach. I am. I am a financial coach. And just earlier this year, I actually pivoted the business, went over, and I'm working um, B2B, 
which is business to business. I'm working with the middle class and the small business community, helping them to turn those, if they're denied for a financial product or service, turn that no to a qualified yes. And on the back end, in the, on the post end of that, to help the banking um, institutions, because I partner with a lot of banking institutions, micro lenders, and um, nonprofits to help those who are experiencing a fi financial distress and maybe up for foreclosure or um, loan default, help them to salvage that relationship with the bank and move them back into a positive position. So that has been the main thing behind the faith, family, and finance. The reason why is because when you don't align your, your money and your goals, it can affect your faith. It can hinder your family and definitely it hinders your finances. And that's also a way for people to know who I am because that's a core of who I am. I'm, I stand on my faith. Um, my family is my armor and my finances give me freedom. Well, and I, I love the fact that you're working with these people in these businesses because you have a hell of a backstory I mean, yes. if, if you can give us the three minute version of when you hit rock bottom, when I first heard your story, I was like, wow, it's just an amazing turnaround you had in your financial life. Yes, I actually hit rock bottom about almost seven years ago, and I pretty much just came on and shared it on social media. Um, and that's where that hashtag came from, from homeless to homeowner and from the floor to Forbes. I was sleeping on the floor with two boys. I told them, we will never live like this again. I just need 30 days to change our situation. And let me tell you something, when you have two kids staring back at you and you're sleeping on the floor, it was time for me to really figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I just told them that give me 30 days and you guys are going to see that we will be in a position that will be able to really impact other families. And 30 days later, I became an auditor and an analyst for the state government. So um, <laughs> <laughs> so that really changed the trajectory of my life. And so many people saw my journey. I literally shared my 300 credit scores on social media. Um, they saw me just go through the journey and they saw me also get to 841. So I literally shared my journey so that way I can able be able to impact someone else and tell someone else that just because where you are is not your destiny. It's a process to get to your purpose. And I'm now finally in my purpose. That it is so inspiring. And I love every time I hear your story, I, I just get inspired again. It's so awesome. And we're so happy you're here with us. But we've got somebody else here with us, Sharita. It's like Texas is taking over the podcast tonight because up uh, north of you in Fort Worth, Texas, it is the retirement answer man himself, Roger Whitney's back. How are you, brother? Mm. <laughs> this is Cowtown, baby. It is Cowtown. Yes. Yes. All I know, Joe, is when you ping me, I just come running. I don't want to, but I just come running. <laughs> <laughs> OG told me today, literally today, that he couldn't be here to record. And so uh, Roger got the call the last minute, put me in coach call. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Tapping your arm. Time to call in the bullpen. And Roger's here with us. But we needed the Retirement Answer Man. Tell the people that don't know about the Retirement Answer Man podcast what you're all about. Retirement Answer Man is an award-winning podcast. We got voted best financial planner podcast slash blog, which is awesome. awesome. Uh, no, but it's a podcast where we just noodle on how not to just survive retirement, but how do you actually really rock retirement? So it's much more encouraging than all the number dollars and cents that uh, most people think about. It's intimidating. It's a scary time of life, and that's sad because it should be awesome. Did you need help, like, coming up with that phrase? Because you use that phrase noodle on a lot. Like, did you need help coming up with that phrase or knowing how to structure it in a sentence? It actually is a word that is used in as a synonym for thinking. And I just actually naturally used it, and then I was in a meeting or I was talking to a listener or something, and they used it back to me. And I'm like, ooh, I like that. And so I th actually think it's important to have your own language to create your own community. We noodle on things. We don't have meetings. We have huddles. We don't work with people. We walk life with them. I think I mean, that I think that's really a, a very interesting use of grammar. That's an incredible use of grammar. Well, I wish you'd I wish you'd stop it because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from a Michigan State education, Joe. Of that course, a Spartan education. That's right. But I, what I was getting to, Roger, was that we have to think. 
But we've got an amazing show. We got the amazing Sharita Humphrey here with us. We got the retirement answer man Roger Whitney here with us. We even got Len Penzo. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from the Women Who Money blog, which, by the way, was also a Plutus winning blog. Congratulations to Amy Blacklock and her team. That was uh, Amy was just here in the basement a couple weeks ago. Uh, This piece is called Is Hiring a Coach Worth the Money? And do I need one? And this is a question we get asked all the time. So what a better time to talk about this than with Sharita, who is a financial coach, with Roger, who is a financial planner, and with Len, who is certifiable. So he really needs a financial <laughs> Uh, this piece, this piece starts off, uh, by saying you're ready to make a significant change or to improve some part of your life, but you're struggling to do it on your own. You're finding it challenging to stay on top of all the things to know, or with motivation or mindset to reach your goal, whether the changes we want to make or the goals we want to achieve are related to our health, career, finances, business relationships, or some other aspect of our lives. We know it takes effort to make progress. Striving for achievement, we read articles, download apps, buy books, courses, and products, following blogs, chatting in forums, joining clubs and organizations, and attending conferences are other ways we might try to move closer to our goals. Sometimes you find all the information you need and take action without help, but you can probably name at least one important goal you haven't met, even after trying different ways to accomplish it. I'm going to start, I'm going to start Len with you because you've been online for a good long time writing the Len Penzo blog. And one thing that you and I have both seen over and over and over on blogs, on websites, it's why you don't need a coach and how a coach is just going to screw you over. They're money hungry, money grubbing people. What do you think? Well, I, you know, it, it depends, but, but I, I think there are many times when a coach is good, um, especially when you're for people who are unfocused or they don't know how they've got like, like the, the article says, like they have all the information in front of them, but they don't know how to put it together. They don't know how to take that information and put it to use. It's kind of like an extra tool in your toolbox. And that coach will help you show you how to use all the information you have to make you more successful. But Sharita, why not just go to, you know, blog post, like it says in the piece, blog post can often point you to a lot of the right things to do. Podcasts can point you to a lot of the right things to do. But what's the difference between what you do and just reading a blog or listening to a podcast that'll point you in the right direction? I think um, just to piggyback off what Lynn said, sometimes is, yeah, you can get all of that information, but sometimes too much information can cause analysis paralysis. And sometimes is you need someone to kind of pull you in and kind of coach you through all of that information. Because I I get a lot of clients, they're like, well, I've listened to all of these podcasts. I I have this information. I have this book, but now I feel stuck because I have so much information. I don't know which direction to go in. And this is why sometimes it's better. It's it's best to hire a coach because they can steer you in a path and kind of give and put some benchmarks in. So that way you're, you know, you're meeting your milestones. Yeah. So instead of just being somebody brokering information, talking about which one's important to you, which piece is important to you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Roger, I'm sure you've heard some of that criticism before, right? About uh, why should I pay you to do something when I could just go, you know, jump on the bogle heads and, uh, and do it myself. Well, and I think, a lot of people can do it themselves mm-hmm. and a lot of people can do it themselves, but still want to have a coach. I mean, I have used coaches for about six years and they have literally changed the direction of my life. And I remember the first coach I hired, I swallowed at how much I paid these people. Uh, but I look back on it and the return on investment was huge because they were the right coach for the right thing. So I think, before you hire a coach, because it's very easy just to hire a coach and you got to define why are you hiring a coach? It's sort of like medication. You have to have the right pill for the right job or the right tool for the right job and then be ready for it. I definitely think from a financial coach perspective or a financial advisor perspective, I never try to convince anybody that they need me 
they decide that they need me and then we decide whether we're a good fit. And then we outline, I think this is important if you're going to hire a coach of any kind, outline what are the objectives? What does a good job look like if we actually go down this path together? Oh, what's the wind? Condi- what, what, like, what's the wind condition? The wind condition? Yeah, what's the wind condition? W-I-N. Oh, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. It's like, well, it's going to be sunny. <laughs> South, southwest. <laughs> this, isn't, like, yeah. this isn't Joe's uh, weather.com podcast. <laughs> I'm so intimidated. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, well, exactly. I remember the first, the, what, not the first, but the third tandem coaches I hired, I remember because I was in a high growth phase and I knew where I was going and I knew that my current skill set and belief system was not the person that was going to make that successful. So I was in the middle of shedding who I was for who I was becoming. And the coaches helped me along that journey to having a better mindset. It wasn't the skills they were teaching me. It was helping me have the mindset of the person I needed to become to achieve what I wanted. So I think that is a good example of a, you know, a win condition. That was my specific goal for hiring these people. Sharita, have you hired coaches yourself as well? I have. And I needed that just at that moment because I was new. Yes, I learned a lot from experiences um, from the up and down to my own journey. But of course, I invested into myself because if I really wanted to be able to really know where I'm going and to be able to really to scale, I knew that I had to invest into myself and invest into someone who went before me. And it was one of the best investments that I made because it allowed me to grow my business exponentially. You know, it's funny, Len, when Sharita talks about investing in herself, do you think that's part of why we hear the negative is that people sometimes invest in themselves with the wrong coach? And so they spend a lot of money and then they just get really negative and go, you know, ballistic online because the problem clearly wasn't them. The problem was coaches are bad. (laughs) Well, I guess, you know, sometimes you have to look within, right? So before you hire the coach, you got to make sure you're willing to take the advice and at least sure. at least consider it. And I mean, I can see that a lot of people saying, OK, I'm going to hire a coach because I have to because, you know, it's supposed to be a good thing. But you're not all in, you know, you're not yes. giving the coach a fair shake and you have to you have to be open. You have to be willing to change and take direction from your coach. And the coach ain't going to tell you how to do everything. He's not going to do the stuff for you. He's going to give you guidance and it's up to you to take that guidance. So I, I, sometimes if a coach isn't working out, maybe the coach did give you some bad information, but um, I think, you know, it's a team effort here. you got to bounce. If you don't, if you disagree with something coach is telling you, then you need to bounce your concerns against to that coach and start having a dialogue. And that's the whole point of that, of having that per, extra person there. I, I think some of that mis- mismatch Joe is sometimes people say they want a coach, but what they really want is a consultant. Yes. Which is very different than a coach. A consultant, a consultant is prescriptive. A coach is more of a reflection in helping you work through issues and helping you continue to frame and, and focus. Whereas a consultant is the one that just tells you what to do. And if you want one and you get the other and nobody's really talked about it, it's not going to be a good experience. Yeah, that's a great point, Roger. Yeah, that is that's really great. Sharita, uh, back to you for a second. You know, Roger said something earlier that caught my ear that I wanted to focus back on again. He talked about how a lot of his clients could do this themselves. Right. But they hire him anyway. How important is it in your practice that you're just a disinterested party who isn't emotional about your client's goal, who's in there looking at it much more from kind of a business angle. How important is that factor to your coaching? It's important, but just to piggyback off what he said, of course, I try to not involve myself with so much of my clients because they do become like family sometimes because they do lean on me and I have to kind of just push them back and say, hey, you can do this. Because it's not for me. I coach from a, I'm trying to teach you how to fish and not to just spoon feed you that I really want you to be able to learn and be able to teach me what I've taught, come back and you become the teacher. You should be able to be able to show me that you've learned what I've given to you. But we do exercises along the coaching program before they graduate the programs when working with me. So that way I know that they're in a place where they don't have to come back to the program because they should have been able to take what I've learned and kind of wing them off because I kind of wing people off. And I, I noticed that 
when I get people that w- went through other coaches, they stuck with them throughout the process. And so it's kind of a culture shock when they work with me because, oh, yes, I was hands on in the beginning, but it's just like, I'm a mom. Okay, you're going to have to learn how to walk on your own. You may stumble a little bit, but you'll be okay. Just get back up. And I love that because really that's the reason I think you'd have a coach, right? What you're saying is like, I was a track athlete in high school and college. You're not going to run the race. You're going to teach me how to run the race. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Len, when you've interviewed any coaches that you've had in your life, whether it's a career coach or, you know, somebody teach you to eat more Papa John's or whatever it might be, (laughs) what are some, you think some of the key questions are to ask a coach before you pull the trigger? Because I sometimes see people hire the wrong coach because they didn't do enough fact finding first. True. I think the first thing you want to know seriously is how much experience they've got. It also, I think you want to find out from them if they have a slightly different philosophy at coming at things than you do. We talked about just a, a few minutes ago, ha- why would somebody who knows ever can do everything have a coach? Well, you know, there's lots of ways to skin a cat. It's very important to sometimes you might think you have option A for skinning the cat, but mm-hmm. option B might be a better way to skin a cat. And I hate that. I know all the animals people are going to, it's say, just metaphor. It's just a metaphor. Mom's, just a metaphor. mom's cat is over here in the corner, <laughs> like trembling. So I think a very important thing to do is to find a coach who's a little different than you. Okay. Especially for something that in something, if you're wanting a coach in something that you are kind of have expertise in already, or you know a little bit about See if you can get a coach who can come at something from a different perspective. I think that would be so helpful. Sharita, that's difficult. And that's actually what I do in my life is what Len talks about. I have lots of coaches and I always look for people that are different than me and look at the world differently. But that's so hard because we want people around us that are like us. How do you shift that mindset? So you kind of do, because I don't know, do you agree with what Len says? I definitely agree with what Lynn said, because, of course, my journey may not have been, in my experience, may not be what someone who's coming to me. And I feel like those are the best coaching clients because we have two different backgrounds. And it may seem crazy just what he said. This person may not need a coach, but they were drawn to me based on even if they heard my story or something that I shared. And I like to say in a coaching when I'm working with clients, we're in a partnership And those were the best partnerships when it was two different people coming in with two different backgrounds, two different philosophies, two different ideas, but we were able to meet and have one common goal. Yeah, that's so powerful. What is one of the best questions people have asked you when they've hired you? The question, Sharita, that you wish more people asked you when they were hiring? The one question I wish people would ask me is, what made me do this? Because a lot of times is people are referred to me, but no one, they just heard my story, but really didn't know me. What makes me experienced enough to do this? Not the blogs, not Forbes, not any of those things. What makes Sharita qualified to do and be able to help you change the trajectory, your financial trajectory? That is one of the ones that I always get because normally when people call me, they're either, I already, I'm, I'm in a, financial space where I have money, I'm just looking for a structure or, Hey, my life is falling apart. You know what, you know what that's like. (laughs) So that's, I get two different, (laughs) I get two different uh, scenarios and I'm like, really, how did this happen? And so it's never what you think. And I'm pretty sure Lynn can say that some of the calls that I get, they feel like they're like, I don't even know why I'm telling you this. I haven't even told my spouse this, what I'm telling you, but you just make me feel just me seeing your presence online or just, you know, you talking with somebody else or being referred to me. They spoke so highly of you. I just feel like I know you already. But I think that that's where a lot of people should stop right there and really get to know the coach and not just because such and such said it or social media said this, because you really need to ask questions that's going to be pertinent to what your situation is. It's so funny, Roger, on the long lines of what Shreed is talking about, I wouldn't get that question enough. Like I would get what my expertise is, but I wouldn't get the connection to them enough. And I found when I did get that, the connection immediately became closer or it was clear there wasn't a fit. Do you get that question often enough? Well, it because, of, you know, just from experience now, we set up fit meetings and I frame it that I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me because especially financial advisors, I don't think do this enough in the sense that 
if the client is not a fit for exactly your competency, you're not setting yourself up for a win-win, right? It doesn't mean that people won't get something out of it, but it's not going to be near as enjoyable. So I set it up and I, I structure that whole discussion where I'm asking them questions about what's their philosophy, what are they looking to accomplish, where are they at in their journey as much as they should be asking me so I can make sure they're a fit as much as I am. And a good coach, I think, should approach that kind of interaction open-handed, where if it's not a good fit, they're very comfortable in, in telling you that and referring you. I think that's a quality that you would want. We're nearing the end of this discussion, and I'm sitting here wondering why every flipping financial article says you should ask coaches about fees, and we haven't yet talked about fees, <laughs> which is, is interesting. Why do you think that is, Len? Well, I guess the, the overarching thing is the fact that you want to coach, right? It's not about money. If you're doing this, if, it's, if money's the issue here, then you're off on the wrong foot already. So I, I guess that's uh, that, that'd be my explanation. Yeah, Sharita. Yeah, I'm totally with Lynn on that too. If it's, if money is the reason why you're in it, I'm on the thing is I'm not in it for money. I'm re really in it to see people win their win condition. Yeah, uh, Roger. You know, I'm actually starting a coaching program next month, Strategic Coach, and it's not cheap. I go to Strategic Coach tomorrow. No, you don't. <laughs> I do. I'm on a plane <laughs> tomorrow to go to Strategic class. Coach. Yes. Well, we'll be able to share this journey together, though. Yes. <laughs> we can you guys be in the same room together, and then one can feed the other one questions for the other guy, and then you can get it at half price. We can. Are you guys a fit? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know what we're going to do, Sharita? We're going to noodle over stuff. <laughs> That's right. a lot of together. Yeah. But, but, while eating noodles. So yes, you wrap your head around that one, but you're right, Roger. It's an expensive coaching class. Yeah. And, uh, price is a really important, especially if there's not clear articulated value being added. And like when I think of financial advisors, being a financial advisor for 28 years, I personally think for the most part, we're not dancing hard enough for a dinner or let me rephrase. Clients are not are not demanding demonstrated value for the fees that they're paying. And I think that that needs to be defined. The first thing I do with a new client is, that, okay, let's define what a good job is. Let's set our own benchmark. What do we want to accomplish over the next 12 months? And we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. And then we work towards those objectives. If you do that, it's very easy to know whether you're getting value for the interaction. Now, if it's from my perspective with a financial advisor, give me your assets and I'll call you twice a year. It's probably not worth it. Well, and it's funny. That's the problem that I have with fee discussions too, is it's never couched. I love what all you guys said, because it's never couched in value. You know, a lot of these blogs I read talk about fee, 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 but value first. I love what Sharita said yeah. about that, about, you know, what's your win condition? You know, how do you, how do you get the win? And certainly I know the fee going into it. And if I got my win and I knew what the fee was at a time, everybody wins. I don't think we pay enough attention to what we get. We pay way too much attention to just what the fee is when we talk about coaches. It's also interesting from my perspective too, that most of my clients, when I was an advisor, they could have done it themselves. You know, they totally, I worked with incredibly smart people. And I just think this idea of not having, you know, this is my own agenda, I guess, of bringing this to the table <laughs> is, that, is that not having smart people in your corner who aren't you, I think is a huge mistake. I think it's a huge, you're saving a couple dollars to go nowhere or not go anywhere fast. You could go someplace far, far, far faster if you hire the right coach. And I see people hire the wrong coach by not asking the questions we talk about today. And uh, man, I'm up on my soapbox, so I guess I'll get back down. But but I think you guys know where I'm going with that. I I, I often wonder, I'm like, is, is the problem the coach or is the problem that you hired a bad coach and now you want to blame coaches? So... Uh, biggest takeaway here though. That's my big takeaway. So Len, we'll start with you. Biggest takeaway on this piece. Uh, Roger's pretty darn old to be a, a, <laughs> a certified planner for 28 years. You might even be older than me, Roger. That's my biggest takeaway. <laughs> Len, Len is so tired of being the oldest guy on the show. He is so tired of that. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> He's beat. He's beat me by a couple of years. I think, I think actually Len might be a year older than Roger. Cause I think Roger I'm 52 years old. Ah, I, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I am. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Sharita, tell me you've got a better takeaway than Leadhead. Well, all you guys don't look any at over 30. So that's my takeaway. <laughs> that so is one of what... <laughs> whatever. Sharita's my new BFF right there. You're hired. <laughs> don't look at my face. <laughs> we just had this conversation. Lynn just said I'm hired. He didn't even ask me any questions. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just take my wallet, Sharita. Right. Uh, but, uh, but what's the real takeaway here, Sharita? Real takeaway is picking the right coach is the best investment that you'll make. And you can do it yourself. But if it's going to cause you to go into analysis paralysis by doing so, hire a coach. Yeah. Uh, Roger? It's made an amazing difference, not just in my business life, but in my personal life. Mm -hmm. It's one of the yeah. best things that I've ever done. Well, as part of our celebration for World Tourism Day, I think it's time for us to help you the way we always do when it comes to traveling to foreign countries. This is another lesson of Spanish Made Easy. Hola, welcome to Spanish Made Easy with me, your host, Jen Hemphill from the Her Dinero Matters podcast. Today, I'm joined by the host of the popular How to Money podcast, Matt Altmix. And together, we will share a popular and simple Spanish phrase so you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Sure. Today's phrase is Tony. I'm not sure your life insurance benefit is high enough for you to pound tequila like that. In Spanish, you would say this popular phrase just like this. Tony, no creo que el pago de tu seguro de vida es lo suficientemente alto como para que tomes tequila de esa manera. Now let's hear the co-host of How to Money, Matt. Try it. Ready, Matt? All right, guys, you chose the right man for the job. Here we go. Tony, no creo que el pago de tu segura de vida es lo suficientemente alto como para que tomos tequila de esa manera. That was, that was just perfect. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike? You too can speak Spanish easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Ciao. See how great that is? Now you can say all the cool phrases like all the cool kids. By the way, big thanks to both Jen Hempel from Her Dinero Matters and Matt Ulmix from How to Money, both awesome podcasts. And now that you know how to speak languages fluently, let's get maybe a touch more serious. Uh, we found this piece, the top six cheapest places for digital nomads to live and work overseas. This comes to us from Live and Invest Overseas. And here to talk about being a digital nomad and living and working overseas, we have our good friend Kat Kalashian, editor at Live and Invest Overseas. Kat, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm so glad you could join us in the basement to talk about uh, being a digital nomad overseas. This, I understand, has been your lifestyle a little bit, hasn't it been? Yeah, absolutely. I actually grew up overseas. Uh, I only went to uh, university in the U.S., and since then I've been overseas uh, for the entirety of my career, really. <laughs> so I've been in Panama, and most recently I'm now living in Paris. Wow. What was your favorite place, or is, is, or is Paris your favorite place? That is my favorite place. That's why I decided to move back there, so I, I couldn't keep away for very long. <laughs> if somebody has made their life so that they can be a digital nomad— what are some of the things a digital nomad really has to look at? In this piece, we're going to go over the top six places. What are some of the keys that a digital nomad needs to look for? Um, internet, obviously, is the very first thing, just making sure that it is accessible for the one thing, but then also that it's reliable and fast and uh, you'll notice as you go overseas that your definition of fast may not be exactly compatible with the local definition of fast. I found that to be the case in, in many places overseas, even in Paris, which has a great infrastructure and has great internet. I don't actually have fiber optic in my building, which I would love to have. So 
it is a little bit slower than I would like it, even though I'm living in the capital city in the center of Europe. So uh, fast speed internet is something that you need to look into in a more detailed way rather than just taking someone else's word for it, really. I would think then cost of living is, is pretty important, too. Absolutely, because you're you're living overseas, you're earning probably in dollars still, if that's you know where your income is coming from. So you want to make sure that your income is going to go as far as it can overseas. And often the case is that you can live maybe for the same amount, maybe for less even, but that you're getting a much richer lifestyle out of it. So the bang for your buck is fantastic. You know, if you're living in a high rise amenity filled a building right on the beach, you know, that's basically the same cost as you were living to rent in a somebody's house in, in a suburb somewhere, you know, the, the cost of living is the same, but the lifestyle is, is much richer. So that means by the way, and I'm, I'm kind of doing this math as you're talking, that means your list is going to change all the time. This list of six we're giving you today next year might be a little different as the dollar value changes. Yes, it's definitely something to keep in mind. You know, I'm living in Europe, so my dollars don't go as far over here, over there in Europe. Uh, and I have to to play that kind of safe. However, there are countries that really play to your benefit. And I mean, to, to be fair, the euro is at a pretty good point with the dollar right now. The dollar is very strong, so it's going far all over the world, farther than it has in the past uh, in some cases. But if, for example, Colombia, which is on my list, is a great value, your dollar goes very, very far there. And it has been for a long time. It, the dollar has been so strong. So it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at your your countries overseas. Our friend Jim Hempel, who just did the segment before this about Spanish Made Easy, is from Colombia. She keeps telling me over and over, I got to go there. So we're going to get back to that. I do want to ask, when you talked about Internet earlier, I had this same problem myself. I went uh, to the south of France, and I I thought I was asking some pretty good questions, Kat, about Internet with my Airbnb host. And to your point, they said it was very fast. It wasn't fast at all. Are there specific questions I should be asking? Is it, do you have fiber optic? Or are there specific things that can make sure that I'm going to be able to reliably work before I get on my plane and go? Yeah, I do think asking about fiber optic is a good way to go because there's no way to hedge that. You know, it's either fiber optic and it's super fast or it's not. So asking what form the internet is in is a good thing. Europe has a funny thing. Um, my landlord, for example, said I had great internet when we moved in, but we found out that that wasn't quite, you know, what we would call great internet. So our building hasn't been wired for fiber optic yet. And what we have is called ADSL, which is kind of between a dial-up connection and a cable connection. Oh, so it's my. not even quite as good as a cable connection in the U.S. So you definitely want to ask what kind of internet it is. Is it through cable? Is it this ADSL thing, which doesn't even exist in America because you guys are far more advanced? Definitely ask what form it's coming in. And if they can give you a speed, great. But know that that speed is going to go up and down depending on usage, you know, throughout the day, et cetera. All right, let's jump into these. The top six cheapest places for digital nomads to live and work overseas, according to Kat, and live and invest overseas. Number six on your list is? Indonesia. So uh, Indonesia, it was specifically Bali, really, is what we're talking about. The DN, the digital nomad DN lifestyle there is really well developed and it has been for quite some time. Uh, you know, it's really far away from the US and Canada, so it's not quite as common of a destination for Westerners, but for Australians, it's the top place to go. So uh, it has kind of been um, colonized, if you will, by Australians already. There are lots of them over there, so lots of people speak English in Bali. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more, you know, authentic, shall we say, this may not be the best place to go. You know, as I'm saying, it is pretty well trafficked. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of people who speak English. It's actually not as cheap as it was, of course, because of all this uh, touristing and traffic over there. But it is still comparatively very cheap. English is spoken. And the, the local language is actually really easy to learn. They say it's the easiest one in Asia because it's uh, very simple and phonetic. So it's actually, if you're looking to learn another language and you want to go to Asia, most of them are kind of beyond your reach if yeah. you want to really get into it. But um, Bahaza, Bahaza, I think is how you pronounce it, um, is actually a really easy one to learn, I've heard. <laughs> yeah, my daughter's in Japan and it is just a tough time learning that one you you write in your piece that you can rent a two-bedroom house with a swimming pool 
for under $900 a month, which is pretty amazing. And by the way, I'm looking at your photo on the piece, and we'll have a link to it in our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. And the photo of this beautiful hotel and swimming pool makes me want to get on a plane and go right now, Kat. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Number five on your list is where? Thailand. Thailand, again, it's pretty westernized. And this one is actually more popular with uh, North Americans. So you will run into other Americans and Canadians over there. The entire country is pretty well developed at this point, you know, at least in the cities. You've got great internet, good infrastructure. Again, it's very cheap. And this DN lifestyle is very well developed in the cities, although might not be in in smaller towns and in rural areas. The other great thing about Thailand is that they actually really do make it easy for foreigners to come over and work in this way. Uh, So they've got really good, easy visa options. Not all these countries do, and that's something to keep in mind. Thailand is definitely, you know, top of the list for that reason. And it has been for more than 10 years now. My friend Chris, who's a world traveler, says Thailand is his favorite place to go in the world, partly because of the fact that it's so inexpensive. You write that you can pay $300 for a furnished apartment in a safe area. This is considerably less expensive than even Bali. Yes, as I said, Bali is getting up there in the the price range. Comparatively, of course, it's still very cheap, you know, if if you're thinking about living in the United States. But uh, Thailand is super cheap. And even in the the big cities, in the heart of the big cities, you can still get something really nice for very cheap. Number four on your list. So Vietnam, actually, it's probably the cheapest on the entire list. It's uh, super, super cheap, way less westernized, way less touristed, I guess, in general. Um, So prices have kept pretty low. It's actually got some of the fastest internet in the world, so you don't have to worry about that. And it's very well-developed internet infrastructure. So even in, you know, rural places and small towns, you're going to be able to connect to the 4G network. And uh, it's actually probably 5G now and set up a hotspot for yourself. So this is one of the places where you really can, even if you're completely untethered, no building in sight, you know, you should still be able to set up an internet connection sitting right there on the beach and do your work sitting next to a palm tree. We took a family trip to Vietnam and only hit Thailand on the way out, but I did have super fast internet everywhere that we were there. And you're right, it was inexpensive. The big thing though, Kat, I found surprising was that I kind of expected some anti-American hostility because of the, of course, because of the war. And I didn't find that at all. Not at all. Uh, The Vietnamese are some of the most peaceful and welcoming people by all accounts. And there is absolutely no historical sentiment lingering over there. And a lot of Americans have this connotation. They think if you're going to Vietnam or talking to a Vietnamese person, that's all that they're going to be thinking about or, or seeing. But that's really not true at all. Um, The Vietnamese have probably forgotten about the war more than we have, I think, uh, according to the people that I know that have lived there for so long. Um, And if you're not going to bring it up, nobody else is either. So I think uh, it's a pretty safe bet that that isn't going to be the case. Yeah, super, super friendly people. Number three on your list was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, Yeah, so Mexico is, of course, very near, uh, it's it's still North America, so, you know, very near to uh, the United States and Canada. Um, Also very familiar, so you're not getting quite as exotic of a a lifestyle as in these other cities that we're, or countries that we're talking about, Um, which can be a good thing for some and not so good of a thing for others, but it's, you know, it can still be very cheap. It's not as easy to find the cheap in Mexico anymore. You know, if you're on the coasts, they're already pretty well developed uh, for tourists. And and there's really what my problem with it is, is that there's this really well developed vacation mentality. So if you're a gringo in Mexico, almost everybody's going to assume you're there in an all, uh, what's it called? An all inclusive resort. You know, yeah, yeah. everybody's catering to you as if you're drinking margaritas all day. Um, which, you know, might be your day sometimes, but that's not your day every day if you're actually a digital nomad working overseas. So it can be a little bit harder to get away from that. And it probably is the most expensive uh, Latin American choice that you could make. Uh, You know, there are still cheap places to, to live and settle. You know, you have to dig a little deeper to find cities that aren't as well touristed and that do feel a little bit more authentic. And Durango is one that I mentioned in my article so far, it's not a place that we'll find. you'll find many Americans, and hopefully it stays that way for some time more. <laughs> Number two on your list. 
Number two, uh, so Colombia, staying in Latin America, Colombia is, you know, often meets with raised eyebrows uh, with lots of Americans who still have this idea of it being a very uh, dangerous, narco-infested wasteland. Um, but I absolutely assure you it's not the case. And uh, I've spent a lot of time there and it's absolutely a beautiful country and so culturally rich. So there's so much to do. The infrastructure is really well developed. Uh, certainly in big cities, I think uh, Bogota and Medellin are where the digital nomad lifestyle is the most developed. Uh, so it's not a problem to to get in, to plug into this lifestyle there. And all big cities have good internet and great public transport. It's not necessarily the case, though, outside of the big cities. So, uh, you know, it's not like, as I said, with Vietnam, where you can just go anywhere and assume you'll have a good internet connection. But another great thing is that it's still pretty close to the U.S. and Canada, so a flight there isn't too far. It's not too expensive. I mean, the other thing is, if you're looking for a Latin America destination, this is definitely a more authentic option than most of, of what you're going to find in Mexico. You know, I don't know if this is a pro or a con for some people, but there's not going to be a lot of English spoken here. Uh, you know, you are going to have to learn some Spanish. But and you're not going to find those American brands on the shelves. You know, everything is going to be much more of a, a local option here. So it's a more foreign experience. If you're looking for a Latin America experience, this is a, a slightly more exotic one than Mexico would be. I know two different people who have moved to Colombia, which at the time, to your point, really surprised me. But they don't like it. They absolutely love it. Like, it's almost like, you know, they joke about how people that do CrossFit have to talk about CrossFit all the time. <laughs> I feel like people in Colombia talk about Colombia all the time. You you write that a good budget for any big city in Colombia, listen, this could be $1,500 and you can rent a nice one bedroom in a more upscale neighborhood for about $650 a month. Yeah. And as I say, because, you know, because most people aren't uh, moving to Mexico or sorry, to Colombia in droves, these prices are staying pretty low. I love Medellin. That's where I spend a lot of time. And there are kind of a few more upscale neighborhoods where I spend most of my time. And that's where you're spending that level of money for rent. If you go outside of those to the, I mean, there's still beautiful neighborhoods, uh, just not as uh, popular, I guess, with um expats that are moving in, you can get rents for 500 or less. Uh, and the cities are fantastic. So I definitely recommend it. And I absolutely agree with you. Everyone that I know who's been there or lived there, they don't just like it. They right. rave and rant about how much right. they love it. And it's fantastic. Right. I have to say my friend, Jen, who is from there, whenever she visits her parents, she brings back coffee and holy cow cat. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. We saved the best for last. You ready for this? All right. So we're moving over across the pond to Portugal now. Um, most people are really surprised that you can live in Europe uh, and that it can be affordable and that it can support a kind of lifestyle like this. Uh, Portugal is a little bit of a unicorn over there. The cost of living on average is about 30% less than Western Europe, but you are still in Western Europe. You're actually uh, on a coastline. Uh, you could live near the beach. In fact, Lisbon, the capital city, can actually be cheaper than living at the beach because the beaches are a little bit more touristed, definitely by British expats. Um, but most Americans and Canadians haven't quite picked up on the Portugal trend, even though the Brits have been going there for 100 years now. So prices have, have kept pretty low, especially in Lisbon, where, you know, you're on, on a coastline. It's a beautiful, architecturally rich, uh, stunning city. There's a great culture. There is a kind of quirky cafe bar culture going on there. Um, you've got the Mediterranean lifestyle and food. So it's definitely a, a top choice and it can be very affordable. There's good internet throughout the country and good infrastructure throughout the country. Um, but the digital nomad lifestyle is especially well developed in Lisbon, I would say, rather than uh, on the, the southern coast where the beaches are. Did that surprise you that Portugal is number one? I guess a little bit, but it's not, again, on the other hand, you know, I've spent time there and I've spent time in all these places. I've spent a lot of time in Europe throughout my life. And Portugal really is, uh, as I say, it's just, it's very unique in Europe. It's not at all like uh, other European countries. It's a little bit more casual feeling, a little bit less stodgy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting to me. It's a place that I've always wanted to go. And it's funny. It's, it's now on my radar 
a lot because of because of you and your writing, Kat. What else right. do you guys? Well, let's talk just briefly about what else is going on because I know this isn't the only thing you guys talk about at Live and Invest Overseas. What else is current on the site these days? Well, Portugal has been our top pick for a long time now, but we uh, Panama has always been a really popular uh, country with us. It's a great business hub. If you're looking to get a job overseas, Panama can be a really good place. There's a really great visa for uh, getting a work permit there. Um, Belize is another really great option, especially because it's an English-speaking country. It's the only English-speaking country in, in Latin America you know, there aren't so many English speaking countries around the world. So if that's a top priority, then living in this kind of sun soaked Caribbean paradise is a pretty good option. And it's affordable. And they actually want foreigners there, unlike Ireland and some of and the UK, where they don't really need new people coming in. Right. So they don't make it that easy for you. Malta is another fun English speaking country that most people a lot of people have never heard of. <laughs> it's out in the middle of the Caribbean. And uh, that's another really, really fun option. So those are a few of the places we're talking about these days. I actually had a correspondent just come back from Taiwan and just write up an issue for me on Taiwan, which I know nothing about yet. So I don't have much to say about it, but I can't wait to hear her reports. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. And we can all read about it at the site, which I'll link to this and the site on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Kat, so fun spending with you and traveling the world here virtually with you for just a few minutes. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. (laughs) Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, I'm in touch with my inner tourist so much. Uh, You know, I'm I'm totally dressed for this thing. I'm dressed in my Hawaiian button-up shirt. I got the cargo shorts on here. Got some some really sweet sandals and some festive dark socks. But here's what I'm worried about. The problem is get up looks so French, I'm pretty sure Joe and OG might like lose me in the crowd standing in front of the Leaning Tower of Pizza over there in France. But, but just how many tourists are going to be there with me? So here's my question. With tourism making up 9.7% of France's GDP, how many visitors does France get a year? I'll be back with your answer right after the break. All right, we explained the amazingly convoluted rules to this shindig to our guests here. Uh, Sharita, do you get the rules of the game? Yes. Awesome. We play this Price is Right style. I should explain to everybody what we explained to Sharita and to Roger. Play this Price is Right style. It's the closest without going over. Roger, do you get the rules to the game? I do. He's got it. I feel like we're, (laughs) we're getting married now or something. All of you are playing on behalf of one of our regular contributors. At this point, Len is leading with nine. Paula, who Sharita is playing on behalf of today, has seven. And OG just pulled ahead of Paula, a.k.a. Sharita, today. And Roger, you're playing on behalf of OG with eight. So because, Sharita, you are in last place... You get to decide, and you're not in last place, by the way, Paula's is, so we'll throw her under the bus. You get to decide if you're going to pick first in the middle or last. Middle. She's going to pick in the middle. Uh, Roger, do you want to go first or last? Oh, I'm always first, baby. He's Oh, so Len gets to go last. How about that? So here we go. Roger, how many visitors does France get per year? One million visitors. <laughs> Sorry, OG. Is that your final You're answer? Right. That is my final answer. One million visitors from Roger. And wherever he is, I can hear OG going, oh, no. <laughs> and then uh, Sharita? Eight million. Any uh, math behind that at all? No, Paula. Just threw that out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> what coaches do. We just throw it out there. <laughs> Len, we got 1 million visitors to France, 8 million visitors to France. What do you think? Is this, is this in metric system or is this the, uh, is this the English? Metric visitors? Is that, where, <laughs> is that where the visitors are slightly shorter, slightly yes, taller? That's... I'm not sure which <laughs> one is. I... <laughs> okay, so no but, but seriously, yeah. folks, but seriously. Uh, this is what happens when you're when you don't your brain has no calories. Uh, let's see. Um, oh gosh, 
Sharita, I really wish the eight million. You, you put too big of a spread in there between you and uh, Roger. I thought this was going to be easy, and now it's now it's difficult. Wow, how many visitors? You know what? I, I, something tells me that Sharita's number is even ridiculously low. I mean, if you're just thinking, gosh, how many hotel rooms are in? Oh, this is all of France. This isn't Paris. This right? is not Paris. This is all of France. <laughs> this is all of France. God, how many hotel rooms are just in all of France? And I bet you they're booked. Well, I guess maybe is there a bad time to go to France? You can I tell think. Lynn is an engineer. <laughs> Did you count the Airbnbs too? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, now I'm, I think you know what? Let's. I'm just going to take a stab, and I'm going to say, how many plane flights go to, to every? Oh my lord! Is this a multi-episode? Uh, okay, let me just do it this way. Uh, let me get my calculator. I'm just getting my ca just get my calculator. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say there's ten thousand visitors a day, times uh, three hundred sixty-five. Uh, oh, now that's a problem because that says three point six five million. So that would be in between Sharita and Roger. Why is that about right? Ten thousand? Yep, I'm going with that. I'm going to say, but I'm sorry, Sharita, I, I'm going to have to go one million and one. Well, well, that's Roger. You're going above. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Roger. I'm going with one million and one visitor. And and metric wow. metric system. And that is the way it done. Roger Whitney <laughs> just got Chelsea Brennan on the show, so. <laughs> I would love to tell you what the answer to this is, but we have to make you wait for a second, like any self-respecting podcast. So everybody think about it and we'll be back with your answer in just a minute. All right, Roger, as long as it's a million on the dot, you got this baby. <laughs> what are you thinking? I like his HP 12 C. I see he had, he pulled that old thing out. I know. I think was, I, I got shenagled. It's, a, it's a that's another word. C. That's reverse Polish notation, too, by the way. You got Shenago. By the way, thanks to Grammarly for that one. That's that's yeah. nice. Good, <laughs> good job. 1.1 million, Len, with lots of math. You got to be feeling pretty good. No, one, no not 1.1 1. 1 million. It's 1 million one and million. 1. <laughs> one. <laughs> one. 1 million and... Um, I, want, I want those extra 99,000 people. Yes, I'm feeling I'm feeling quite, quite good. I, I'm cocky good. Cocky good. One million and uh, Bill or whoever the one visitor is. Yep. And then Sharita, yep. you've got everything north of eight million. You own everything north eight million. That's got to feel pretty good. That's a major real estate there. Yeah. Well, included the Airbnb. That's right. <laughs> Sharita's math had the Airbnb in it, Len. You missed out on that. All right, uh, Doug, take it from here. What's the real answer? Bonjour, Mezanis. Before the break, I asked you how many tourists France gets a year. Uh, last year, France got an astounding 89 million visitors to see the city lights and the beautiful country surrounding it, which is uh, where I'm pretty sure the Leaning Tower of Pizza is. If you got that right, celebrate by jumping on a plane, taking an Instagram picture of you pinching the Eiffel Tower it's so funny when people do that. I love it. You know, they, they, they it makes it look so small and they can just squeeze it with their little. Anyway, smell you later, my little croissants. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. I saw, <laughs> Len built, burnt all those calories thinking and he was no closer than I was. Oh, my God. Now you're super hungry. <laughs> yeah, how'd that calculator work out for you, Len? Terrible. That's ridiculous. <laughs> It's almost embarrassing. Oh, very good. Yeah, you're all, I got you. <laughs> it's almost embarrassing to say we were that, close. We were really that, close. that Sharita was the closest, which you missed it by a factor of 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should almost not get credit for that. <laughs> I mean, I think she's it. even playing like the lawn dart game where the closest wins, you still threw it out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> it's the next stage. That's She's like still throwing in. <laughs> but either way, no matter what, Sharita, congratulations. You got the win on behalf of Paula. Good work. Thank you. Yes, you got to be feeling great. And Paula, I'm sure, yeah. 
thanks you. Without any calculator. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just that calculator in her brain. <laughs> hey, guys, let's take off the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, Sharita, you know what you find? <laughs> you find yeah, money. You find that's exactly <laughs> You find cha-ching. You find that those financial products you use every day, they're nowhere near the best in class. Over 92% of the products available online all ranked at Magnify Money. So whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, the right credit card to go to 0% and pay your debt off, or a lower rate loan to consolidate your debt, whatever it might be, Magnify Money has it. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Today, we're, we're going to help Nicole magnify her money. Say hi, Nicole. Hello, Joe and OG. My name is quote unquote Nicole. I love listening to your show, <laughs> even though the only time I learn something is during Doug's amazing trivia. Recently, I listened to the episode on whether or not it's possible to retire early with kids. I've just turned 31, and in Marissa Tomei's words, my biological clock is ticking. My husband and I both want to start a family, but are concerned about finances. We're debt free make 157,000 and our savings rate is just over 55%. We currently rent at 1700. We'd like to retire early, but the problem is we both started saving far later than we would have liked. Currently, we have about 20,000 in my 401k, 5,000 in my husband's. We have 4 months of expenses, about 11,500 saved up, and we have 13,000 saved up, which we'd like to invest but haven't started yet. I wanted to see if you could point us towards books or podcasts to help us learn more about being financially ready to start a family. I wish there was a magic number, like if you have 50K saved up, you're good to start popping out kids. (laughs) Oh, and in case you're still doing shirts, my size is a woman's large. Thank you again. And in Doug's words, see ya. (laughs) Nice. Nice job. That is how you do it, stackers. Right there. Nice job, Nicole. So Nicole wants to, using her words, start popping out some kids, Sharita. So not my phrasing, (laughs) you know, let's, let's not just do books or podcasts, but some of your thoughts about starting a family. It sounds like she's a little bit behind, but she's saving at this wonderful rate. Like they are saving a kick-ass amount of money. What do you think, Sharita? And then number two, what resources do you like? For me, I have to say there's never going to be a right time. And the reason why I say that is because we're always getting to that thing. We always try to plan every little stage of it, but kids are going to be expensive no matter where you are. But the great thing about them is they do, they are saving at a kick-ass rate of 55%. For me, I would say that to continue to do that because we see that the cost of living is steadily increasing is so is college. So if that's something that they're thinking about that the 55% that they're currently saving is great. And so one of the resources that I love is just because I'm a mommy and I love her is the budget mom. Yeah. Yes. Love her because she's really instrumental for those who have started a family. She is one that I highly recommend along with Lydia Sin. Um, I love Lydia because she's a mommy and she's working and she's done it all, but she's showing you in a way that it doesn't matter if you got started behind or you're not even started yet, she's a great resource to be able for those who are thinking about becoming moms or becoming parents. We're going to link, by the way, to all of the people, not just the awesome two that Sharita just mentioned, but to everybody that we talk about here on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. So Nicole or anybody else, if you're driving down the road, we got you covered uh, or, you know, you're on your walking the dog in the morning, whatever it might be. Len, what do you think about having kids? Because did you and the honeybee have kids? You guys had kids at a fairly young age as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say fair. Well, I don't know. It's all relative. I, I, 30, let's see, I was 32 when, when I had Matthew, okay. my son, okay. and uh, 34, I think, when I had my daughter. So I don't think you should be worrying about whether you're going to be able to retire early or have kids. I, I mean, that's kind of a weird choice to me. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just have the, if you want kids or you don't want kids, if you want kids, by all means, don't wait. You know, if, yeah. if you're ready for kids, Go for it. And the savings, yeah. look, you you will be able to – it sounds like you've got your heads on straight. You know how to manage money. You're saving a lot now. Everything should work out. I mean life happens and you get these weird things that might come up, but you got your head screwed on it financially. It's all – it's plain to see. What are you waiting for? Have those kids 
and you do the best you can. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I had a single income family. My, my wife's a stay at home mom and I'm retiring fairly early here. So, um, it can be done. Sometimes you overthink this stuff. Just yes. go and have those kids do it. Yeah. Sharita, you're really nodding. Yes. The reason why I'm nodding is because we see so many people waiting and putting things off. And I can just say from a female standpoint, um, and being the only female here on the show today, is that we're seeing an increase of infertility as we start to wait an age. And we're like, I just wanted everything to be perfect. But there is this what Lynn said, there is no perfect. If you want to become parents, you'll figure it out. And sometimes is your kids will actually be your additional motivators for you to really get into a path. If that's retiring early is something that you want to do, then you, you, you'll you have that extra motivation because when you're looking back at that little one, your whole life changes. And so for me, I'm just like, I am had my kids fairly young. Um, so for, and I wouldn't change a thing because everybody always asks me that. That's something that I always get. Would, would you want to do it? Would you rather wait? Oh, because I have the best of both worlds now. I had my older kids, and now I have an awesome four-year-old, so I'm in a different position. But I can now say that I've experienced something different that money can't buy, and that's becoming a parent. Yeah, we we uh, also had... Uh, our twins when we were fairly young. And now, you know, my kids are, I'm 51 and my kids are 24. You know, the older they get, the smaller that gap seems and they Mm -hmm. seem more like friends than, uh, I mean, I'm still parenting, but it's really, it is really nice. Roger, you've had to have this like uh, Sharita has with clients. When you get this type of question, what do you think? Wow. I don't think this question has anything to do with money. Mm -hmm. I think whether it's having kids or retiring, you're never ready. You're never financially secure. And I think it's more of creating a life. And I think from a financial advisor, coach perspective, and in the media, everything becomes the calculator because it's very elegant and life is just messy and it's up for us to create. And there are so many things that will happen as a result of having kids it's part of the maturation process as an adult, you could argue. I don't know if I'm using that word. Graham really can tell me using that correctly (laughs) or not. So my two resources, one would be to read Love Does by Bob Goff, which is always good for the soul. And when it comes to the money part of it, and this sounds like an advertisement, I think my book speaks to getting outside of the calculator. And if Joe gives me her or your address, I'll send it to you. But I think both of the, it, it's not about the money. Yeah. You do what you want from a human perspective and the stars will align. It sounds like you three are, uh, I'll speak in line. You're all three aligned on that. I'll throw my hat in there as well. Two other resources that I like of people that are dealing with that to find podcasts are Wendy and Curtis Mays have a fun podcast called the house of Fi. And it's, uh, they are juggling. She was just on the show recently. They have uh, six kids and they're trying to get financial independence and they interview other people that are going through that journey. And then of course, Andy Hill, who's my neighbor and an awesome guy here in the Detroit Metro area. He just won the Plutus award for best family blog. And his podcast is called marriage. Yeah, It's called marriage, kids and money. And he's also interested in juggling all these different things. So, but Wendy Mays and um, Andy Hill's podcast, I think, are two good ones to add. Well, thanks for the question, Nicole. You got a question for the show? Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And you know what? The cool thing is, even though Nicole told us what size t shirt she needs, Gertrude, mom's friend Gertrude, uh, who's also the basement room mother, she's just going to send out a code and Nicole can pick any size she wants. <laughs> And she'll take home the greatest money show on earth circus t-shirt that shows what a circus it is here in the basement. That's going to do it for today, everybody. We're going to have our guest of honor, Sharita, go first. We'll go ladies first. Sharita, tell us what's going on right now at uh, Faith, Family, and Finance. What's going on with me is that I'm writing a book. All right. <laughs> I'm excited. Awesome. <laughs> and I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I put it off 
put it off, but now I'm in the point of writing a book and I am bringing some other fellow coaches um, under the brand um, early next year. So I'm really excited about that. But the book is something that I'm really looking forward to. And I'm I'm really, really excited about it. I was nervous and put it off, but now, now it's time. You have to make sure and tell us when it comes out and we'll have you back on and let's talk about it. Definitely. When you okay. come back. Great. Thank you. And thank you for having me having me. I really enjoyed the show. Are you could you save the show. You totally with the, <laughs> these two Nimrods that you're with. Are you kidding me? Uh, but, but if people want to hire you, how do they find you? Um, you can go over to my website at um, www.sharitamhumphrey.com. Nice. And you know what? Like I said earlier with everybody's recommendations, we'll also have that in our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Mr. Whitney, what's happening at the retirement answer man podcast? Well, first, I want to thank you for letting me be on the show. I really kind of like it. So, at which, the which, which you act like <laughs> that's hard to say. At first, I think, oh, that's a nice compliment. But then I think, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to like it or not. But, but I kind of do. Um, no, I love the show. Love you, man. Yeah. Uh, so awesome. answer, man. Show. Well, we, we're coming up within a month or two on the first uh, anniversary of the Rock Retirement Club which is this online community for people over 50 to surround yourself with like kind of people noodle on how do you not just survive retirement, but rock retirement. And I've been <laughs> away at over 260 people. We're doing a retirement rodeo roundup conference, yeah. up, which is crazy. Uh, so that's what's going on at retirement answer, man. And I just started a new blog for financial planners called financial planner freedom. So we're busy. You are, but you're always juggling like five things. We're always just Coaches trying to will make you do this. Coaches will make you do this stuff. They will. And, <laughs> and, and you just hired another coach who's going to make you do I, more stuff. Amen. Len, what's happening at the persistent itch.com. No, people, a lot of people don't even know that joke anymore. That joke goes so far back. <laughs> what's, uh, what's going on at lenpenzo.com? And, and again, I've, I want to thank Paula for not being here. So I don't have to follow her and her, her, all of She's always doing these phenomenal things, you know, interviewing presidents and and uh, <laughs> all that stuff. So this, uh, once again, thank you, Paula, for being not here today. Uh, I am doing 22 things you should always haggle for. 22 oh. of them are out there, if you can believe it. Always haggle. You should never just accept the base price. I, Give me one. Give me one. You want one? Uh, yes. Okay. How about, let me see, I'll look up. Come through here. He does uh, something it really interesting. Uh, oh, yes, this is a good one too. Because I used to do this when I was younger in my rock star days. Musical instruments always don't ever, ever, ever go to a music store and pay the list price ever. Okay. Up to thirty three percent off for haggling. I have a question. When you talk about haggling, though, and I got to see this piece ahead of time, why is being being a contributor to the Stacky Benjamin Show number three on that list? <laughs> I, 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 I can't figure out why. I thought I thought you liked it here, Len. I, and then I go read the thing, and you're like, I should have haggled harder. <laughs> So, so bad. Hey, I got it. I got a good, it's free, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, that, that, that was good for me. Yeah. Yes. That was great for me. I got, we got all this for free people. It's amazing. All right. That's wow. going to do it for us today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, sure, Joe. But you know, if these people graduated high school, like I almost did, they're probably smart enough to figure it out. But you know, I I'll tell them anyways, just to be sure. Uh, it, here's the first one. Is hiring a coach worth the money? Well, maybe it needs to be the right coach. And you got to want to change up for someone telling you stuff and you don't want to hear it. Well, great coaching isn't easy and you shouldn't expect your coach to be easy on you. Second, thinking about working for yourself, take some advice from Kat Kalashian from Live and Invest Abroad. Maybe traveling abroad could allow you to travel and subsidize the cost by working. But the big lesson? When you book a trip to Paris, make sure it's to Paris, France. Last year, I saw a beautiful Paris, Tejas, that's Texas, for those of you who aren't as cultured as I am. It's the home of Dr. Pepper. 
seriously, it is. Look it up. But their Eiffel Tower has a cowboy hat on it, which is so not cool and not as fun to pinch with your little fingers. I wish I were kidding, but that's seriously what you get when you don't check the references of your travel planner. Special thanks to Sharita Humphrey for taking a trip down to the basement. You can find more about her at SharitaMHumphrey.com. Thanks to Kat Kalashian for helping with today's show. You'll find more ideas on living and working abroad at LiveAndInvestOverseas.com. Len Penzo was gold on today's show, wasn't he? Well, at least he's hoarding it all under his bed. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Lastly, thanks to Joe's mom for not letting me forget to practice my foreign language. Au revoir, amigos. Gratizi. What are you still doing here? The show is over. Go home. Welcome to the after show. This Sharita is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. So we don't, okay. we don't, we don't talk about it. I, I would say that to Roger too, but Roger's been here before. So that's he, why I'm taking okay. my shirt off. Cause nobody talks about it. It is so creepy. Oh, so it's like Vegas. <laughs> it is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is, this is the after show where you don't talk about it at all. But, okay, you know, gotcha. we talked about coaches. Two of you guys are coaches. Len, you've coached people in your career at work. I know you've led people. I want to talk about bad coaches. Like what are just, what are some just either bad coaching moves or bad, you know, was there anything just wild that a coach did? Roger, I'm going to go to you first because you're nodding your head that you you may have a story for us. So I went to this workshop once. It was a financial advisor conference, and I went to this pre-workshop where they had brought a gentleman in, and it was an amazing afternoon. And I was like, this dude is awesome. He's exactly what I need. Real friendly. Talked to him afterwards. So we hire him, and I, I fill out all this intake stuff. It was not inexpensive. I fill out all this intake stuff. I had to do a lot of pre-work before I had my first chat with him. And so we're on the phone. He's like five minutes late. And it's very obvious that he is cooking while we're talking. And I can hear sizzling. And it was also very clear that he hadn't read any of all this pre-work I had to do. And it was basically the same stick that was in the workshop. The stick was good, but it was maybe two or three inches deep. And I was so upset that this guy would not read anything and come to something that I paid a lot of money for. And it's obvious that he's cooking while he's talking with me. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's horrible. The workshop was great. And I got sold on that, not realizing and doing my due diligence that there wasn't much depth there after that. Nothing else. Sharita, how about you? Oh, I'm glad this is the after show. (laughs) 
years. <laughs> so I invested into a coach and I just have to say it's subpar. I just, I guess from seeing so much and hearing so much about her and, you know, social media. Yeah, I was quite disappointed because Grammarly sponsoring this, right? Because right. I felt like all, every, <laughs> I felt like everything that I got was Grammarly's dream. Like, <laughs> I'm just, I was, You're not talking about it a, you? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> And you sent me your info in a Word doc. <laughs> like, you didn't even just take the extra step to put it into a PDF. I just was just like, <laughs> I just, I'm like, for you to be a million dollar, a million, a multimillionaire, I was just kind of disappointed. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I was expecting Chick-fil-A service, but I kind of got Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, and, and what was the most disappointing part is that even after, you know, like she wanted feedback. She's like, well, oh, so you guys wanted me to actually coach y'all. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> yes. And so I was just so taken back by that. So I can get why some coaches get, you know, in this industry, we get beat over the head sometimes because you do have those because I would have never guessed in a million years that this would have been the experience that I had and not, she will rename uh, nameless, but I was so disappointed. I just was so disappointed. And so when people even ask me, well, what was your experience? I'm the most political person that you guys will ever meet. You know, I was just like, well, you know, um, she sucks. It was not, <laughs> no. Okay. I, that's what I wanted on the t-shirt, <laughs> but, but I was just kind of like, well, you know, I printed the information. That was my, t no lie, I feel so horrible for even saying this, but that was my response. I said, "Well, I printed the information, <laughs> so I don't, know. I don't know how they took that." Now, just saying that out loud, <laughs> but that's what that was my response, and so it was kind of disheartening. So I get it when people are kind of afraid and have so many questions about coaching because I've had my bad coach experience, but thank God I've invested into other things and met some wonderful people, but my very first experience was horrible. Great. Yeah, it was horrible. Oh. It was just like your first, it was like your first time I, being back. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that was off the record, right? I'm sorry. Absolutely. That was so <laughs> Nobody listens to the after show, so you're good. You're fine. What, what, Except everybody. But that's, but that is, I, I, uh, I can't believe it. Len, how about you, man? You know, I really don't. I all I can do, I, I hearken back to one of my baseball coaches. This doesn't compare. Did to you Rogers just say? Or, or did you just say that you hearken back? Yeah, hearken. that is how old. Hearken he back, is. I reckon. I reckon I'm gonna hearken back. You were born in 1880. What? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Roger and Joe both knew what I was talking about. They both <laughs> understood it because we, right. we had grandfathers. Right. <laughs> so there. Sharita's the yeah, Shari <laughs> still over there looking up. What the hell does this harken back mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. She's got it. She's, she's got the Googler uh, out right now. I should, have been, <laughs> I, I should have been speaking in old English or something like that. Like yes. Ye harken back. <laughs> but you're, but anyway, you're baseball coach. I don't know. I had a baseball coach. This isn't this story. This should have went first because this can't follow uh, Sharita and, and Rogers. But I had a baseball coach, and he he insisted that I should be a switch hitter. One, he said, you know, I was batting right handed, and I was batting about two seventy five, two eighty for the season. He goes, we got to get your batting average up. We need you to be a switch hitter. So I, for a couple weeks, he trained me to be a switch hitter, and I'm trying the best I can. Well, I go to my first game with uh, doing the switch hitter, I'm going to be batting from the opposite side, strike out, go up the second time, strike out, third time, strike out, fourth time, strike out. He said, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, we'll keep going, keep going. <laughs> next game, first at bat, strike out, next at bat, strike out, next at bat, strike out, next game comes up. I'm sitting on the bench, and I'm like, how come on? He goes, he goes, Penzi, you're, you're not playing today. You're, you're sitting on the bench. I'm like, why? It's like, what the heck's going on? He goes, he goes, you, you're, you're 0 for seven in the last two games. And you're, you know, we need to, we need to get some better hitting in there. 
like I'm batting from the wrong side of the plate. <laughs> oh, you that's, believe that? That's so that's horrible. Right there. That's a bad coach right there. Even that is the a bad 1880s, coach. That's a bad coach. That's a bad coach. And I never batted. Well, you turned I never batted well. left handed again. <laughs> <laughs> 275 wasn't so so bad. No. I mean, it's not great, but it was. I was really than- worried this was going to go a wrong direction with uh, you should be a switch. I, I, I know. I stayed Whoa. with me. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, don't tell that story, Len. <laughs> we'll save that for another hour. Save that one for the after after show. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know if any of you guys ever saw the, there was a play that became movie and it starred Jack Lemon, Alec Baldwin, uh, Kevin Spacey, back when you could say the word Kevin Spacey without, you know, back when he was an yeah, actor but- and not not a creepy dude, and um, uh, Alan Arkin, and it was called Glen Gary Glen Ross. I love um, that movie. Yeah, so Glen Gary Glen Ross, Alec Baldwin comes in and he's the he's like the new sales guy. He's laying down the law, and Jack Lemon gets up to get some coffee just to set this up for people. He's got the coffee pot in his hand. Of course, Jack Lemon at that time is a pretty old man. Alec Baldwin's a young guy. And Alec Baldwin says, put the coffee down. And Jack Lemon turns around like all worried. And, and, and he goes, coffee's for closers. And it's something about you haven't closed anything. Yeah. So I'm at this sales meeting <laughs> early in my career. <laughs> And there's this doofus leading the meeting who's like supposedly a coach for all of us young financial. And this is back, you know, in my early career it was before any of the fiduciary people. It was all a sales organization. I'm sitting in this room and that movie had just come out and some guy in the middle, you know, gets up some first year financial consultant gets up and he starts walking toward the back and he grabs the coffee pot and the guy in the front of the room literally goes, put the coffee down. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you, do you really think you're Alec Baldwin? It's like coffee's for closers. And I'm like, Oh, this couldn't be worse. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> 